Interpretation of history is key. My grandfather struggled. My father struggled. I must struggle. My child will struggle. My grandchild will struggle. I have a history of struggle. I have a history of resistance. Thus, it is incumbent upon me to struggle. Interpretation of history is very key. Good day, brother. How you doing, my dear brother? New episode of Hella Black. Hey, man. You know, you got your... If we go back to some of these old video episodes... Uh, Go back to the old ones. You're going to see me with some braids, you know. Fast forward to 2023, my brother got some braids. I remember there was a time, yeah, hey, I ain't never going to get braids. I mean, I was just impatient. <laughs> I think it's a testament to where I am in life, though, as it pertains to patience uh, and my divestment up, from a Western culture, uh, specifically for the black man who, I don't know, I feel like I had to look a certain way. And like being clean cut was always important to me. Not to say yeah. that it's not now, right? Uh, yeah, you still clean cut? Yeah, but I just, okay, this is what it was. <laughs> nah, for real, like my hair is hella nappy. Like actually like very, very nappy, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and so I just had to do some work around letting that go. Cause that's what happens when you have four months, right? Growing your hair out and you have the kind of texture that I have. It's like hella nappy, mad shrinkage, you know what I'm saying? But no, I'm over that. Yeah. Brother got that stash. You know, very much on Brother got the bros, man. Strong you know. stash. I was thinking, bro, same thing to you. Same along the same lines. Uh we really been doing this podcast for seven years. That's insane. <laughs> that's a, that's a wild. Seven years. That's a long time. Seven bro. years of content. I don't know if I what's even wild is some people have been listening for seven years. <laughs> I feel like it's one thing to make it for seven years, but there's people like who bring up all the episodes. I'm like, oh, I said that. I remember when you said this, I said for real. <laughs> Ooh. It's good and bad though. It's good, at, yeah, because yeah. it's like you look back on some of the things you said too, some of the old episodes. I'm like, I definitely well, disagree, but hey, evolution, transformation, yeah, emancipation from old way of thinking to a new way of thinking. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's all part of your process of growing. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely things I wish I didn't say in the past, but also I read some books now. I can't remember what I might have been reading Malcolm's autobiography. I'm like, yeah, he definitely probably wouldn't agree with. <laughs> I just read, let's just, I've no, read that, books where I'm like, yeah. I don't, like, this is a, a byproduct. This person said this as a byproduct of their understanding, as a byproduct of uh, wherever society was at that at that point, yeah. um, which led to them to reaching this conclusion. Uh, and that's why I would say, you know, for anybody who's going through a political education process, you know, be very conscious of the things you put out into the world, uh, publish out into the world. Like, my writing stuff, I don't feel... I don't feel ways about that, but like tweets and shit, I'm like, bro, what the fuck? But that's because I was just, that was that I wasn't time so much thinking, I was just putting stuff bro, out. That, that was, yeah, that was a time period for sure. Like where Twitter was like, think about the first thing you say and then tweet it. Like that was really like, it was like your, your brain no <laughs> it has a thought and then you just tweet it. <laughs> no you know what I'm saying? Well, whether no it was about PE or whether it was about mm -hmm. anything, like that's like, there was a certain time in Twitter. That's, that's but how But my Twitter writing was. though, like all my like early articles, I read some stuff, even, uh, you know how me and you met when I was writing about the, the organizing y'all was doing at Cal. Yeah. You know, it was a very, um, looking back at it, it was a very liberal piece. You know, like it didn't really make anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist uh, analysis and connections as to why y'all would even have to work for such things on, on campus, right? Even though yeah. I was mentioning George Berkeley and the Confederacy and uh, uh, LeConte and all these different things, right? Um, but I don't look back at that because it was also very well researched and just based off my where I was, it was at still, the time. It was, it was, it was still strong journalism. You know what I'm saying? Versus like those tweets where we we just talked about where you just like saying stuff, um, pure, with no real merit. You know, feeling so like emotion, emotionally <laughs> charged. You know, so if I you talked about people, I bring that up because you mentioned um, folks who might have been listening since the beginning. You know, and so I think anybody who's early on in their, in their PE process right now, just be. Try to be as conscious as you possibly can about certain declarations you're going to make because um, even if you identify as like a revolutionary pan-Africanist and you are very versed um, in the, the thoughts of like Seko Toure, Cabral, uh, Nkrumah, uh, Maurice Bishop, Julius Nairi, uh, even if you might find yourself versed in what your understanding is only going to deepen, yeah. which means, you know, you might not necessarily... Uh, you just not gonna have the same takes, the same understandings. Or hopefully, if you actually develop it, you know what I'm saying. So just I mean, be conscious yeah. of what you say. It's always being conscious and always understanding that viewpoints are growing, viewpoints are changing. We're always, we always should be evolving. You know what I'm saying? Like yes, yeah. like constantly. Without like everything is always changing, 
And if everything is connected, you feel me? We're going to have to adjust. <laughs> you feel me? Like, well, Yaki said, you got to stretch it. Yeah. <laughs> you got to stretch things to fit the time you're in. Yeah. As soon as that stretching don't work, you got to stretch it again. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And mold it to the condition that you was facing. So I think probably every writer look back on some of their old stuff and be like, ooh, you feel me? Or I, I remember I looked back on one of my old articles I wrote probably in college. I'm like, ooh. But then I just stretched it. I rewrote it <laughs> yeah. to fit the time. And it ended up being stronger. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So part of the process. Regardless, we've part been doing process, this we've been doing this for a long time and um something I think we should be proud of. Yeah. You know? Hopefully like, I mean we've had we've had people give us feedback in terms of how they have resonated uh, with our own journeys, how they find the, the, the content and the, the subject matter uh pressing, useful and value and valuable. So you know, I, that's a win in my book. And I hope that as we take another dive into doing video content, which is very hard, you know, very, very, very hard. Um, it wouldn't be hard if all we did is just podcast. Yeah. Might be a little, some challenges and whatnot, but when you live in a full, <laughs> yeah, full life with organizing and working and family and all types of other things that go on in life, I think podcasting is just hard in general. Like a lot of people. To do a good podcast, I would say. Yeah, I mean, you could just throw, you could just talk. Because even but, those earlier ones, I wouldn't. Now that I know what I know about like structure and storytelling and flow, I wouldn't say that our earlier podcasts were good podcasts. Was sometimes we didn't even have outlines. We, early, early on, probably the first like 40, 50 episodes, we didn't have outlines. We would just get up there and ramble, you know. And at times, I'm <laughs> the, sure if you the, listen to the I, outline was a Hennessy bottle, you know. <laughs> and so, I believe based off again structure, flow, um, that. I wouldn't call our early podcast, you know, that good. And so I would say doing a good podcast to where you can actually keep your listener engaged and allow them to, um, yeah, allow them to stay engaged, to follow, to follow the content, the subject matter um, in somewhat of a linear way. I don't think every podcast does that. I don't think every podcast does that. And that's, that's a true skill. And then when you yeah. get into video content, that's a whole nother skill. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? To, like, to make people want to stare at you the yeah. entire time. You know what I'm saying? Like to look and be like, oh, this is, you know, I'm, I'm, feeling this. I'm following y'all. It's a whole thing. Yeah. So I think pod, podcasts can, because so many people are doing them, which is why, again, when you was, you know, saying we were, uh, I guess, discussing needing to do video content again, you know, I'm kind of doing my research and looking at some of the stuff. I'm like, damn, everybody got a podcast right now. Seven which, years ago, it was different. Yeah, which I, 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 I think there's an audience for, for everybody. and but it's just it's such a a watered down field because people think it's very easy and that's why the cream rises to the top and you know I'll be watching some people I'm like okay nah this is actually nah, a good especially some of the sports stuff that pops up now I'm like yeah. nah this is actually pretty good, good. you know like or when it's like actual good journalism or you can tell I don't know if it's the actual host that are doing it but yeah. their production their team. production team is fire <laughs> you know what I'm saying and even if you a host, you got to have a certain charisma again, charisma, style, swag that make people want to, you know, Listen buy into you. what you got going on. Turn it on to YouTube. Yeah. So, turn it on to YouTube right now. <laughs> Subscribe, well, Apple comment, Podcasts, all that. comment. Yeah. You feel me? Let people know that Hella Black is back on YouTube. You feel me? So subscribe, comment, like it, share it. You feel me? That's how we spread our word. You know what I'm saying? We ain't got no big marketing budget. We just got the people behind us. You know what I'm saying? So appreciate all the love, all the support. Uh, especially as you know, we've done this Tales of the Town project, and uh, we're just starting to get back to hella black. You know, we got we got more stuff coming as well, similar to Tales of the Town. Soon, I don't know how soon, but we're gonna yeah. make it shake. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so and to, to your point around you know, folks liking, subscribing, um, joining our Patreon, Patreon.com backslash hella black pod. We definitely need anyone who is. Uh, I would say philosophically and ideologically aligned with uh, black liberation, with black empowerment, with community, uh, egalitarianism, with freedom and liberation. If you align with those things, uh, please boost our work just because, again, we talk about everybody having a podcast and so much of the stuff that's being put out right now. Reactionary. Very, and just culturally negative. Culturally nationalist. You know, it's, it's negative. Pessimistic. Encouraging colonial behavior, you know what I'm saying? Encouraging integration, encouraging being part of the system, encouraging getting money, you feel me? Like, yeah, and I, I ain't going to say... Yeah, yeah. Get money, you know what I'm saying? But get money for the people, too. But I'm, I'm not going to say that our podcast is, is the best, but 
I would say it's, it's the best a part ever. of a, a full scale and full circle approach uh, to impact the community. You know, we, we are trying to share the knowledge that we've acquired through our own uh, learnings, whether that be through films, through books, through podcasts, uh, through music, you know, uh, wherever we acquire knowledge, we try our best to share it. And this is one of the pl- platforms that we do it in addition to uh, our actual community organizing through people's programs. Uh, and I say all that to say, we definitely need y'all support uh, because we up against a machine, a machine that produces uh, content to push forward uh, Western values, to push content that pushes forward individualism, that pushes uh, c- consumption, um, that pushes you know, being a docile human, right? To not really form an analysis of the how the world around you functions so that you can contribute to it in a way that actually aligns in the ways that what you want, right? All yeah. of us can actually name, for the most part, that we don't agree with how society functions. Uh, but yet many of us- Still buy into it. Whether consciously, unconsciously, yeah. right? But Or we don't attempt to learn ways that we can shift it. And so our podcast is an attempt at showing y'all the ways that you know we can all come together to make change in this world. Uh, but we need that because so much of what's on is just gossip, right? I'm looking at, everything is just talk show. And it's just having celebs come on, talk current events, talk current gossip, uh, without much of a, you know, an educated uh, understanding of mm-hmm. the social, economic, and political systems and institutions that govern our everyday life. And that's what we try to do, right? Mm-hmm. We wanna talk, pop culture talk current events but in a way that actually lead to some change some change otherwise we just talk <laughs> not just an investment in this uh you know pseudo intellectual celebrity culture yeah outside I mean, spill. I mean, we, we, we fight against i don't think people realize how deep it is but we fight against essentially this capitalist imperialist propaganda machine oh, yeah. and that propaganda machine is so strong you don't even recognize that it's propaganda you know what I'm saying? Because that propaganda might look like you, it might talk like you, it might try and relate to you in a certain way, but it actually is diametrically opposed to your humanity. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So that, that's what we're up against. We're up against these white supremacists, white supremacists, Zionist corporations <laughs> that is uh, pushing liberalism, that is pushing neoliberalism, that is pushing uh, cultural nationalism. And you feel me? When you're talking real stuff, we fight against, you know, I know AI is a big thing right now, but like we fight against the algorithm. <laughs> if we fight against the algorithm and we fight against, honestly, shoot, being our content being surveilled. Our content being surveilled and pushed to the side. Yeah. So when we say support, the people support. You feel me? That, that, that means a lot because that's what we up against. We up against a, a political machine that's invested in our genocide. So we need the support to be able to get out the real word. Feel me the real message of how we can uh, transform ourselves uh, and transform our communities. A lot of people don't even know that content like this exists. Now, I could again, I think we can do a better job. We can do a better job of getting this out there. Yeah. Um, And if we know whatever rationalizations we can make of, you know, different organizing stuff that that organizing life stuff that at times can make being consistent with the podcast difficult. but you know, we, we've had this conversation before, which we're going this podcast, we're going to talk about revolutionary art, specifically uh, the art that we have produced as people's programs in Hella Black Podcast, right? Um, but imagine, you know, at times being me and you just sitting down, like, okay, we've read 100,000, 100 some pages, 1,000 pages this week. Like, you know, I actually want to give my eyes a little break and my eyes and brain and just watch something, but I don't want to watch something that is, you know, Invested in my destruction. <laughs> you turn on HBO or something, there's some demonic shit on there. Act like actual. We was watching Shazam last night. It was just like, bro, like demons coming out the ground, you know? Uh, and again, it's a comic book, but it's like, hey, what is up with, what what is up with Western mean? society and, and demons? demons? Like, this, like, that's all you see. Like, we don't never see nothing about angels and, you know, like we hardly ever see that, right? And if it is, they battling demons. Um, but we talk, we have these conversations around, like, there not being much content to feed the soul, right? You know, like, Damn, I wanna I would do wanna watch some TV. You know, I don't think TV is just like you I don't think it's all negative, right? We we say anything that, that's negative can be used for positive. Yeah. But like how often if we when we pull up our YouTube, if we're not watching boxing, you know, some combat sports stuff, uh, you know, most of the black power stuff that we are forced to watch, uh, is the stuff that can give us a, a real sense of meaning and, and uh connection to the continent for uh us as new Africans, a connection to our struggle here and understanding and just like the beauty that exists in all of it. We be having to watch old Malcolm, old Ture, Julius Nairi, Asada, like all this old, old stuff, right? There's like nothing in contemporary times that 
that can really, really relate and speak you know, truth to the struggle. And I we we've had they've they've had they've done things right. You get like a a Judas and the Black Messiah right that points to some Black history stuff. Um, but even then, you know, like I just be wanting something that like actually can can feed me. You know, like really feed my soul. Um, I mean, and really where do like go? Yeah. And also learn at the same time. Like, yeah, we want to learn. You know? I mean, if you think about it, like a catalog, like some of these streaming sites have, you feel me? It's endless content. You feel me? It's endless. But for something that really feeds your soul, feeds your spirit, you feel me? And, and help build community. Is there endless content yeah. of positive images, of positive stories, uh, of stuff that's actually centering the people? It ain't. And again, we you know we fight against capitalist imperialism, but. You know, hopefully we can begin to contribute uh, oh, yeah. deeper and deeper. You know, and I think uh, it's a good segue in the tales of the town. You feel me? Because I think that was like a, a, a bigger contribution that we made to media space, especially to, to Oakland, as well as uh, a different type of storytelling. You know what I'm saying? With uh, it being scripted, highly produced, hella interviews and just being a different type of a sonic experience from a podcast lens, as well as, you know, having the film, uh, the book and the album. You know, I, I feel like that's. That approach was was important, was important, you know, and continuing to take approaches like that, I think, is going to be important as well. You know what I'm saying? Like really, finely crafted media. You know what I'm saying? And I think there are other. Um, I don't know that many. I do want to shout out. Uh, it's real black on YouTube. I be getting a lot of content from them. Again, it's like old stuff, right? Like I be watching. That's where I get some like the Malcolm stuff, uh, Toure. Um, but yeah, I think anyone who's actually saying they want to make you know, tell stories, create content that's um, uplifts the people, that shares knowledge, awareness. Um, you know, I hope that they find inspiration through the Tales of the Town project because we need more of that. Yeah, like we 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 actually need more. We of that. need more. It ain't just about us. We we trying to inspire yeah. other people to be able to take similar approaches that we took. You feel me? And to create projects that celebrate their locale, or you feel me, or a certain story to them. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? And that could like actually change the way people think about themselves. They people, they community, you feel me? They family, you know what I'm saying? Like we need, we need to address it all, <laughs> and we need people, the community, to get behind these smaller projects, uh, because these things aren't cheap to make, and not cheap. The only way to <laughs> combat or be able to somewhat compete with those large scale industrial projects is to have your community get behind you. Right? Like, imagine if we had, ever, you know, it's four hundred thousand people in Oakland. We only did a couple hundred. At uh, our premiere shows, oh no, no, I'm sorry, a thousand, a thousand. Okay. <laughs> That's a drop in the bucket. Oh, yeah. At the De Young, right where we take it across the bridge, on uh, the San Francisco, that stadium or that uh auditorium holds like two sixty, two twenty nine, yeah, like we, between like two thirty and two sixty, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I they, it was definitely like two sixty five. I think was the cap, okay. right? And so we had almost two hundred sixty five people. In, well, we did over two sixty five because it was two showings, right? So you get around like. Let's say between the Bay Area, between our four shows, we've done outside of the schools that we did, right? We probably did like 1,500, 1,600 people. Yeah. There's 400,000 people in our town alone. You know what I'm saying? Like, we got a very small drop in the bucket of support that we can get, right? Yeah. Uh, so, it's, it's just going to take a lot more community support to actually be able to uh, get these type of projects in front of as many eyes as, as possible, yeah. right? Granted, we haven't put it out online or anything, nothing like that, but... Uh, yeah, hey, we, we we need community support. It all comes. That's the only way you can combat these very mm -hmm. large entities that are backed. Yeah, but I think that's why you know at least for a first project like that, those is decent numbers. You feel me? Because then it's like, all right, you got, you had that fifteen hundred people. Now people's talk people is talking about it. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Then all right, the next one. All right, you had fifteen hundred for the first one. Now it's five thousand. You know the next one. Oh, yeah. it's ten thousand. You feel me? And that's why I think uh, strong media is so important because if you affect one person. I could be happy with that. Well, you change one person's life. You know what I'm saying? And then if you think about the impact you had on that one person, who was that one person now seeing? That one person is now having an impact on other people, but you're the one that impacted them to think how they think it. You feel me? So now that changes from one person to five people. Then that five people impact, now they're impacting five more. Now it's 10. You know what I'm saying? That's really like how change <laughs> yeah. you know, happens. It starts small. Everything starts small. It starts with a person, two people. You know what I'm feeling me? Saying, oh, I got to be. And then from there, making a shake. And going down, you feel me? Trickling down. <laughs> or trickling up, you yeah. know, amongst the people. So for you, what has been the best part of uh, 
I guess like the creative process of Tales of the Town and then being able to go out and, and distribute it. Uh, I mean, we essentially went all up and down California. We haven't, yeah. you know, but yeah, what has been the best part of, you know, creating it and then also uh, pushing it to the people? It's hard to really just nail it down to one thing, in my opinion. I would say from an individual level, like just watching like myself, like both of us change, you know what I'm saying, throughout that process. Like both of us really evolve in the way we approach the work, you know what I'm saying? Like the way we approach media, uh, the way I feel like we really had a goal of making this very like accessible to a wide range of folks, you feel me? So I would say like, just like that uh, internal aspect of creating and watching how like these stories, these interviews, you know what I'm saying, working with different people, like how that actually changes you and the way you think about things as well. So I would say that from an individual sense, like that, just that change itself, like a uh, whole different person from when I started <laughs> or from when we started, you know, Tales of the Town to when completing it. And I would say, too, it was just like a, a measure of like hard work as well and discipline despite, you know, the challenges that it might have had, that we've had, you know, in getting this project out, especially, like, as a very s- small team, you feel me, putting our money together, you know, uh, but if we ain't going to put our own money up, <laughs> why would we expect somebody else? If we ain't going to put our own money up, why are we going to expect someone else to believe in us if we ain't going to do it ourselves? So I think that is definitely another aspect of it that I appreciate is that, like, we was going to find a way, you feel me, no matter what. Uh, to make it, you know what I'm saying? And I think it was just a new challenge. You know, I think with Hella Black, it's like, all right, obviously we can improve it and make changes and adjustments and and have new ways of thinking around it. But, like, to do this podcast versus to track, hey, this is Tales of the Taps, you know what I'm saying? Like, to track, like, that was, like, a whole new skill, which at times could be frustrating learning how to track and find your voice and whatnot. But being able to uh, really struggle and, like, try and perfect a new craft Mm -hmm. like i admire that aspect and just like shoot just learning more you feel me like even you know learning more from like yo experience more experience that you have in like music and stuff like being able to learn from yo experience um as well as other people around me you know what i'm saying that was working on the project like just being able to have more skills you know what i'm saying so i appreciated like the new challenges the new hurdles and then uh Honestly, just uh, seeing people react to it positively. You feel me? <laughs> like, all right, you put all that work in, but if no one liked it, it's like, oof. <laughs> so I think uh, the people getting behind it, you know, I know we was talking about it with small numbers, but I would say we still got, we got a lot of support, especially for a, a small, local, homegrown project. Like, we, we did numbers for, you know, charting, uh, front page of Apple Podcasts, you know what I'm saying? Uh, we had a lot of, you know, a lot of support behind it. Uh, and it was dope just seeing like a lot of people come come behind the project. You know, there's a lot of people that was involved in the project, even though it was just like this first thing that just started like, hey, let's do a podcast on on Oakland. And then just seeing how many people came to support it. Like, I just think it just reminded me of the power of community yeah. as well as like why we need strong media that is actually authentic and telling the people's stories. Mm-hmm. You know, because a lot of times we just get this bastardized version <laughs> of media of quote unquote representation that is actually harmful but I feel like we was able to have a good balance um, you know of the pain but also the beauty you know what I'm saying like <laughs> the negatives and the positives it wasn't just like this negative approach you know what I'm saying it was not nah, I was like we're gonna tell it all but then yeah fam- having and then having the family stories documented that's, that's huge <laughs> that's huge especially being a, a being in the academy at one point, just thinking about like how I used to like search for archives, you know what I'm saying, in the library. I'm like, okay, this stuff can be archived one day. You feel me? Yeah. So, yeah. What about you? What was it like for you to highlight these stories, you know, uh, from your hometown? Like, could you ever saw saw yourself doing that, <laughs> especially as a young kid? Like, yeah. So, what was that like? Man, I, I think first you made like two big points um, that. I think like post the project have really begun to resonate with me. I mean, I spoke on it, spoke on it at the Dion. Like, um, I think it really is a testament to how we both have grown as writers. Um, You know, if I look back to when I was studying journalism in Idaho, and I can remember like being in like the computer lab and stuff, and you know them giving us um, different exercises to be able to. 
tell stories in you know long format, short format, right? Like you got your little three hundred word column you gonna have to do, or you got this longer you know front page spread that you get right. Just being able to show your range, um, and right us having never had wrote scripts before, specifically like you know like a you know, having never not having experience writing scripts and uh, being able to admire like okay, how do you approach writing podcast scripts and you know, she essentially walking us through it one time and then us being like, okay, bet. <laughs> just like. You go in you one know, room, I go in the other. Then we were reviewing and, the script a few days yeah, later. I think that's a real testament to to um, skill, talent, commitment, and buy-in and like discipline. But then also, it also shows why political education is so important. Because I believe that Julius Nairi's Ujama and him really dr- drilling home the importance of like self-reliance as it pertains to building nations uh, and how small countries, right, as a result of imperialism, will have to work harder and longer um, if we really want to see... And be innovative. If we really, you know, we're going to have to work harder and longer, right? Like, don't uh, development can only come from an uh, individual, right? It can only come from the people saying, like, our true sovereignty, true development can only come from the people and their commitment and their understanding and the building of their own skills. No one can, de- can provide that for you, right? So us saying, like, look, we can't look out. We can only look. We got to look in here first for for whatever solutions, right? Um, and not being too beholding to uh, not having, you know, huge budgets and not having companies behind us. But us saying, like, bro, like, what can we do? Like, at always at any time, what can we do? What, how can we figure this out first, right? So those two points of... Uh, the skills and talents that we possess as writers uh, to dive into something we've never done before. And then also that real policy of self-reliance. And that's why I believe that PE is so important, right? By being able to make sense of how Africans uh, have struggled throughout centuries to be able to see their dreams come into fruition, whether we're talking about Julius Nairi in the Tanu in, in Tanzania, or we're talking about Delincey and Abbas trying to put, to, be, to put together this project in North Oakland, right? Like, I think it's just a true testament of us trying to embody that that real African fight, that new African fight. Uh, and then highlighting stories of the town. When you've, we've said this in, in different uh, settings as people ask us about the project, and it even comes up in a lot of the episodes, right? Uh, where D Naz is talking about, man, you just know when Oakland, you just know when some Oakland shit come on. And then Lily talking about um, in a sports episode, like it's just something about Oakland athletes. We just carry ourselves a certain way, right? So it's just something about Oakland. That, that dog and Yeah, <laughs> when you just you just have a certain pride and why wouldn't we? When you look at how much the city has provided to new African culture. Like why why wouldn't uh black Oaklanders have a sense of, of pride? And so growing up here my entire life, uh it was instilled in me at a young age. Um and so being able to use you know, the skills and resources that we've been able to acquire as a result of being student athletes, as a result of having success in media and being able to branch that out further into the community and be able to highlight these stories. Uh, it's a blessing. I don't feel like it's anything different. It's again, you talk a lot about picking up the baton and, you know, struggles being a, a relay race. And so I feel like we just doing the exact same shit that everyone before us has done. Uh, this is just our attempt can, to contribute to, uh, you know, centuries, uh, cent- well, as it pertains to the new African context, right? Like centuries, but we talking about thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years of uh, African history. We just trying to contribute to that. And so, yeah, I'm hoping we can get it in front of more of the population because I believe that, you know, it's going to resonate. Uh, I mean, Oakland is only, what, what are we at right now, percentage black-wise? Twenty-two percent, I believe. Twenty 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 percent black, right? So I don't know how we still have. We've only reached a drop in the bucket as it pertains to. And we uh, see all these uh, moratoriums that is ending. You you know, these evictions going to step up. uh, Who knows what's going to be like in the next? Yeah, but hopefully we can just get it in front of more more uh, black folks in Oakland. But I also think that you know we did a good job of making sure that everybody could appreciate it as much as we censoring uh, black folks. But it's understanding like every block you walk on got got some history to it. You know what I'm saying? So. uh, it was dope. I feel like this was a attempt for us to use art in a different way, in a different medium. You feel me? I feel like this podcast is art, you know, in a certain way. But uh, what do you think is the role of art in revolutionary struggle? And how important is it, you feel me, to wage, you know, this struggle to free the land? Yeah. 
we got this second volume of Free the People Press, which is the magazine uh, written and produced by People's Pro- People's Programs and our organizers, um, which will be coming out in June. Yeah, well, shit, June is almost here. Uh, which will be coming out <laughs> in a couple weeks at our community pop-up. It's where you'll be able to purchase it for the first time, June 25th. Fire is going to be on the YouTube screen right now. Ooh, Insert fire right yeah. here. Yeah, we should have started off with that. People might have tapped out already. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. You can, you can, I bring up the pop-up and where you can get it. I mean, I bring up the magazine and where you can get it because in it, there's a story that um, that features Emery Douglas, uh, former minister of culture for the Black Panther Party, and most of you probably know him for all the graphics and stuff he did. And shit, the lead producer of the Black Panther newspaper, right? Uh, and then we also interview, he also is interviewed in collaboration with Sanai, who... Um, is the creative director, founder, and owner of Matto Future, uh, Oakland-based um, clothing line. Sanai has also done a lot of the design uh, work for people's programs. If you look at the shirt that Abbas is wearing right now, um, Abbas, I mean, uh, Sanai designed that shirt for us, right? And so anyway, we interview these two people, and Emery highlights the importance of the Black Panther newspaper and all the revolutionary art they were making, whether it was, you know, designing the pig and showing all these different, uh, essentially like highlighting the struggles of new Africans in the United States, um, so-called United States, and their struggle, right? You had the pig, you had shit, him depicting uh, the war on the streets, right? Uh, and that artwork that he was doing was not, was not just a representation of the people, um, but also a a means to give new meaning, uh, new purpose, new heights to what new Africans were experiencing. And so, man, if we look at what revolutionary art can do, that's one aspect of it. And then for us specifically, what I've noticed, what we've experienced with Tales of the Town is it's been a huge recruiting tool for us. Huge. Uh, Huge. (laughs) We literally have like, signed up hundreds of volunteers as a result of it. I'm thinking people over here waiting to uh, buy some merch. Whole time they waiting for the laptop to sign up to volunteer. It really, it really was our biggest recruiting tool. Like we, yeah. I, don't, I don't, we can't think of a time where we've been able to just at that point sign up hundreds of volunteers to come get involved. And then at our poetry, so we did also did a poetry right. So for Tales of the Town, we also like a boss was saying earlier, we did a book, we did the film, we did the podcast, art exhibit, and we did an album. And so part of the act, one of the activations we had where we had artists from the album come out and do um, like a poetry, a poetry event where everybody spit their verses and hooks or whatever, uh, spoken word style. And there in the back, we had a volunteer sign up table and we also had a donation station. <laughs> so, hey, man, if we talking about, you know, art representing the struggle, art giving people a means of uh, understanding what's going on in the communities and then shit being a vessel for it. Uh, mobilizing and organizing the people, you know, they, they go hand in hand, man. Like, and we we witnessed it, period. Like, we always understood it, right? Based based on our own studies of the Black Panther Party, uh, shit. What Che was doing out, what Che and, and uh, Fidel were doing out in Cuba, right? There's one thing to understand it though, and the next thing <laughs> to put it into action. You yeah. feel me? To <laughs> to study it, to understand it, and then to be able to execute. And have the impact that it had, you feel me? And that it's continuing to have in terms of recruitment, in terms of changing the way people think, in terms of actually providing uh, spaces that is, you feel me, uh, relevant to the people, you feel me? But also, you can have fun and it it ain't has to be just like this massive turn up. You know what I'm saying? Like, not like we can have cultural events and uh, events with art. You feel me? That like actually change the way people think about themselves, the way they think about community, the way they even think about organizing. You know, because sometimes I think people think about organizing as this very far fetched thing, and not just realizing actually, uh, like we just essentially putting simple truths into reality, mm-hmm. trying to make a change. You know what I'm saying? So I think that's that was these events have been huge. <laughs> so, so outside of uh, the magazine and tales of the town, how else have we been using art in the program? I mean, I think even if we, look, like I said, the podcast, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, literally us starting a podcast and wanting to talk about these issues, which I, I see this podcast as an art form, right? As a, a cultural production, you feel me? Getting it to, to change the masses of people, to change their consciousness, uh, to evolve their consciousness, you feel me? From a, 
capitalist imperialist way of thinking or a colonized way of thinking to a revolutionary evolutionary way of thinking so i say the podcast first and foremost you feel me like really starting this in a shipping container <laughs> you know what i'm saying and then going outside and, and seeing what we've seen and like now nah, we got to make a change we got to make a change for the people yeah. you know what i'm saying but i think also like too our understanding of history and then applying that history into the current has been super important as well like if we just even think about our logo you know what i'm saying like even like on the health clinic, you feel me? Like free to people, free to land. You know what I'm saying? You got the the people's programs logo. I've been out there doing security, and people, oh man, that logo, nice. You know, like I, I resonate with this, man. Y'all, y'all Africans. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. Like, like so that actually, like that, just that visual. I don't know in the, the art world they might say the, the visual landscape. You know what I'm saying? Like, but the, you feel me? The representation of, of like the logo and how that like actually gets at people's like emotions, that gets at, gets at people's spirit. But no, nah, I can get behind this. Yeah, like, yeah, I might not be feeling healthcare, but like I see you feel me this while ago. I see the free the people. I see the free the land. Oh yeah, that makes sense. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I say art has had a has had like a very uh, fundamental role in a way to where it isn't. I th- yeah, where it changes people the way they think without them even realizing it. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. where it just becomes so like a part of your like your brain is being able to understand it without even like having to think super deep. You know, like even when you go into the warehouse, it's the first thing you see <laughs> is a mural. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We are our own liberators. So you might just see that hella times, 150 times over, you know, a few months, like going in and out of the warehouse. Like that's actually having something on your psyche. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm going to be my own liberator. Uh, that's a reminder. Oh, free the people, free the land. Then you see Malcolm up there, El Haj Malik El Shabazz. You see in Jalil. You see in Sophia Bakari. You know what I'm saying? You've seen all these uh, Kwame Nkrumah, Patrice Lumumba. You've seen all these inspirational figures as he was working. As you, you know what I'm saying? As he was uh, working for the people. That's going to have a shift in the way you look at yourself. Like, nah. I, like, they looking at me. I I, I got to make this hygiene pack. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I think even, even that is part of it. And then, you know, going into the warehouse and, you know, you always have speeches playing. That's a role of art as well. Consciously or, or not. Like, oh, you listening to this speech. You feel me? You listen to this uh, information right now, and then you're about to go serve the people. You know, so I, I see it as a even all the photography. Like we have people doing photography in the program. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Taking photos and being able to use that and 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 uh, have those pictures capture the essence of the program, the spirit of the program. You feel yeah. me? Like even the art exhibit we put together. That's essentially was us all culminating all the different people we know within the program and within the community and creating an exhibit. It's changing the way people think. <laughs> you know yeah. the writing feel me people reading and engaging in the writing I'm like oh wow like people was actually like standing in front and really, I don't, you know what I'm saying it's yeah. one thing to have it up there riding up there but like to actually see people like reading it <laughs> really reading yeah. it and then someone be like oh hey these are my favorite pieces I'm from the from the oh like wow you know so I feel like we was able to like at the program we've been trying to blend everything possible <laughs> we gonna take everything that people resonate with even things that I might not even resonate with myself, but we know that it resonates with other people. And I think that's the role of like, uh, like cultural production is understanding the pulse of the people. Mm-hmm. And I feel like we've done a a, a a decent job of since we're amongst the people, we know the pulse. Yeah. And I think we've done a, a decent job, and we need to uh, continue to build that out. Like like we say all the time, like they, the capitalist propaganda is we're good. It look nice. It make you want to buy into it. You make you want to buy into it. You feel me? And I think we're getting to a point to where the program and the art around the program is getting people to want to buy into it. The capitalist propaganda is so good <laughs> that it makes you say, against all odds, I will be that millionaire. Against all odds, I will be the one to, I will be the CEO. Now, the revolutionaries got to create the content that say, against all odds, we will get free. <laughs> Against all odds, Against we all will odds, secure the land. We will get free. Against all you odds, feel we finna kick Africom off of the continent. Against uh, all odds, we finna unify all the different tribes, all the different nations under the banner of Pan Africanism. That's what we gotta do to where it becomes that human nature within our spirit. Nah, this is this is what it is. <laughs> this is what it is. Yeah. We finna make this reality right now, and art has that foundation of doing that. Without question, it moves the people. Mm-hmm. That's why the Panthers They was involved in everything The Panthers, Panthers had a band <laughs> You know what I'm saying Like they knew the The power of music To have To shift the consciousness I mean look at all their rallies They always had some type of performer 
You yeah, know? we here to free Huey, and we we here to raise his money. We got all this stuff going on before Bro. before the Grateful Dead go on. Bobby finna come talk after they get off. Elders finna get up on stage. You know, like they understood it, Bro, And then they brought brought it down to the classroom. Simple chance off the pigs. Yeah, little kids singing it. Free Huey. They singing that in class. They ain't doing no pledge of allegiance. You know what I'm saying? Like, but thinking about how those chants, how those, how that art, you feel me, transforms the mind into action. Mm-hmm. And that's what we got to correct. Not just art, just to be like, oh wow, the. Come I mean, we got we got you know, we, black we, art exists, yeah, and that's what exists. Emery was saying. Is like, bro, but if you talking about now, like that, if you talking about doing stuff for social justice for change, then it needs to be directly impacting the people. Because we got a million black movies, black writers, black directors, black musicians, but like, what is it actually doing to change the material conditions of the masses of people? That's a fact. Well, what is, what is it doing, and what is these you know these singular people being integrated into a uh, you know a capitalist society being able to uh, change their own lives and maybe the lives of a few people around them? What is that doing for the masses of people? Mm-hmm. And it don't got to be either or. I mean, I believe art that is liberatory has to be tied to an organization. It has to be tied to a revolutionary struggle. Like art as ex- as itself as like an individual act. What is it doing? You know what I'm saying? Especially in like validating self. And is the true validation of self an individual thing? You feel nah, me? Like and a lot of times that. art be used as a weapon by the it, it is used as a weapon by the neoliberals. I mean you turn on the saying? TV, we talk about it right now, all the commercials, the music that come around. Or like all these like exhibits that popped up in like you know, the, this time period of, of the uprisings, it's like black death. You know what I'm saying? Like that's the focus of it. Us dying or some shit. And that's like, oh, it's so powerful. Like, what is powerful about that? But then these people leave, or let's say even oh. shit. You know, even you get all these people into a room. Y'all talk about it, but what happens? People go back to their regular life. You don't give them a a way to make the change. You know, what or I'm it's funneled into some bullshit nonprofit that ain't that ain't that's been running for twenty years and still ain't did nothing to decrease the police violence in that community. Still ain't did nothing to stop houselessness in that community. Still ain't done to meet the material needs of the people. And so we push in, bro. Do that, yes. The art is very much needed, but we should be able to point that into a, some scientific process that actually is going to show the numbers, right? We able to show out. Look at bro, if you leave here, we did twenty four hundred yield. We yielded twenty four hundred uh, pounds of fresh produce. If we can get shit twenty y'all to come help, we believe we can at least double that number. Mm. All this fresh produce went to families in, in West Oakland in need. Look at you, all you doctors in here. We did uh, thirty six clinics last year. We believe if we can get five of y'all to sign on, we can double it. That's some. We gotta have something to point out to other than yo. We got we had the red carpet event. We had all these people pop out. Uh, it was lit, man. You feel me, man? Nothing we happens do. though. Again, nothing happens to to positively impact yeah. the material needs of the people, man. So we need that, man. How you feel that art can restore people's humanity? You know, and then essentially you restore people's humanity. How 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 then can they make change? I mean, shit. We talking about art being, I see like they they connect, right? Art can influence and represent life, and so uh, I think about shit. I was recently reading the Spooku Side by the Door, and it's it's a shame that it took me. I just read it as an adult, right? Uh, like last month, damn near. Or this yeah, month. I never read it either. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I watched the movie though. Yeah. yeah, movie fire. It ain't better than the book. Probably not. Not uh, definitely not better than the book. I movie, watched the movie. I watched, watched the it? movie. Yes, I turned it off. Fuck, I'm not. I'd rather read the book again. Book is fire. That's crazy. Regardless of it being fiction. That's crazy. You thought brother, that movie the, great? Like in like you talking about uh, messaging? Yeah. Okay. Messaging. <laughs> the, I mean the, it, the editing. Well, I also watched it on YouTube and like you know sometimes because I was watching um I was watching the Battle of Algiers right. And some they have like different versions on YouTube where like some of the stuff is actually cut out or whatever. So I'm like, damn, I don't know if this is what's happening with the spook who stepped out the door is like being Probably cut out or whatever. That, that, you know, especially sure. the FBI tried to destroy yeah, all the I'm, copies. I'm, I'm not on that. Yeah. yeah, but the book is fire. I read that shit in two days. I was talking to Rob about it. Rob was like, you know, I read that in one day. I'm like, yeah, I saw to die. But uh, that is a fictional book that. I believe is impacting me in a way that makes me want to be a better organizer. You know, so we talk about getting yeah, art influencing, representing, both representing and influencing life, right? Uh, 
even though a lot of these political theory books, I don't know if they would be classified as art, right? But to me, I take all writing as art just because I understand the process to be one of you taking something that exists only inside of you and putting it into a material thing. That to me, that's a that's art in every sense of the word. Um, and so, yeah, we talk about our political education, right? We got a long list of books that we make people read prior to membership, post membership, post membership exam. Those things definitely influence the way that I live, whether you're talking about Ujama, whether you're talking about We Are Own Liberators, whether you're talking about the Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare, whether you're talking about Consciousm, whether you're talking about Sada Shakur's biography, autobiography, whether you're talking about Huey's autobiography. Um, all these books have helped me make sense of who I am, right? Specifically as it pertains to the damn near half a millennium new Africans have been over in this land and being subjected to all the ills and uh, psychotic manifestations that this country can come up with right uh it all has helped me make sense of who i am gave me especially shit identifying as a new african and understanding the history of the republic of new africa where you know you got 500 people coming together in detroit making that declaration like now nah, we free right picking up the torch passed down by elhaj malik shabazz saying that we need to take this to the united nations right all this has helped me make sense of who I am, like actually giving me an identity. Whereas before I thought I had an identity, right? And it was really just a manifestation of a, a new African subjugation, right? <laughs> but now like, yo, though, this is who you are. Then we went to the, you know, we went to the continent. Then I just came back from Texas, visiting my, my great grandmother's hometown of Port Arthur. This is all just helping me make sense of who I am, you, right? You the, art being, the art being the catalyst, but then going and living the experiences. So I, I believe that, um, Art, it educates, it, it brings about an awareness, uh, and it gives you a clear, starts to give you a clear understanding of like what you can do, right? So like even the people, we was, let's use this example perfectly as how art was able to raise awareness. We went into, before we did the D Young, before we did the LA shows, before we did the Bay Area shows, we went into damn near, we went into like 10 classrooms in Oakland, multiple schools, multiple classrooms, right? And we presented, the film to the kids. And we was asking kids like, all right, you know, who started the Black Panther Party? You know, the first recruit was, all, all these things right now, like, oh shit. Being understanding that the Black Panther start Party started right here in y'all hometown. The first recruit was Lil Bobby Hutton, 16 years old. You're never, too young, to make, you're never too young to make change. Yeah. <laughs> like it was the art that was able to influence these kids. All right, then you had some kids, then we just had a whole classroom come to a program. We had teachers Two different from the classes. programs. It was the art that made sense of the reality around them, and thus influenced their actions. They're making now. grocery boxes. Come on, man. <laughs> Talk about power to the people. <laughs> Come on. And if we never had a project like Tales of the Town, never invested like we did into it, it would have been very hard for us to even get in those classrooms. Because now it's like, oh, we have a product we, we show to them. You know what I'm saying? Everyone want to talk about history to some degree. I mean, everybody can get behind a film. Everyone like, can ooh, get behind a film. film. You feel oh, me? Well, Versus yeah. like, ah, oh, this podcast. Just the podcast. Or, or you know, we want to come in program, and talk and speak you know this, you know, saying? speak this radical ass shit. Nah, it's like, yeah. all right, the film, we're going to do the film and then, yeah, we're going to talk the radical stuff after and make sense, help kids make sense of it oh, yeah. in a way that's accessible. You feel me? And that's, that's art in itself. Like us being able to not only make a film, but then to be able to go up there and talk. Well, that's a production in itself. <laughs> one, one, one of the things that I Hello? think one of the biggest art projects to probably come out of the new African community is in 1900, W.E.B. Du Bois did an exhibit at the Paris Exhibition. So this is in the 20th century. They used to do, well, probably post pre-20th century as well, but based off how, I've, how I remember it, they would have like these big world exhibitions, I believe maybe every year, and it would just be in different countries, right? And so in 1900, Du Bois, he did the one in Paris. And this is where like they would, each country would show like they are in like, I remember like the American shit was like Coca-Cola and TV. That was like the <laughs> exhibition, like and ice cream. Like, oh, we ice cream, we, you know. One of them, nigga, they had black, they like, uh, I think the French, one of the exhibitions, they had slaves in cages. You feel me? This is uh, 19th century, I think this is going on, right? And so in, in 1900 in Du Bois, Du Bois exhibition, he got all these charts, all these pictures combating all the uh, anti-African racist tropes that have been presented by America. He's showing how if black people are exposed to uh, given the rate, given the opportunity to, to read and shit, it was like, oh, we read at a higher rate than the Irish, we read at a higher yeah. rate than these people, da, 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 da. Then it showed, it was a, 
you know, at the time, I think it was birth of like his more talented ten type of shit. But still, nigga, it was showing like y'all talking about we all monkeys, we can't read, we can't do this, nigga. Here goes all these things we do. Mm. You can't deny that. And this is art. He had charts showing like all these. It was it's fire, bro. Like, but I think that's a. It was a. It was a. Uh, an attempt at using art to highlight contradictions and expose truths. I thought that's a win. And to get people to see themselves differently. Like, yeah, these niggas tell you, you do, you do know that anytime you're given a chance to read and you learn to read, you do read better than these niggas. Anytime you're able to do, these are the things that black people invented. This is the contribution we're making to the, you feel me? These are the rebellions that we had. And we, you feel me? We was Look what history of Pan Africa. We read that book, nigga. I'm like, oh, what the fuck? We done did this. Wait, we didn't did what? We done did this against all odds. Come on. When you realize what you've been able to produce over and over again against all odds, then it makes us as the cadre in this present day with uh, more opportunities to roam across the plantation with more uh, resources at our behest. Not saying that, again, we're dealing with a different system, right? You know, 70, 100 years ago, they wasn't dealing with the mass fucking neurosis that is a byproduct of uh, the MK propaganda Ultra, machines. You know, like, CIA, all it wasn't, yeah. but we still, we got, when you, when we, when we hear Jalil's story about being in solitary confinement, when you read George Jackson, you feel me? Like, how can you feel sorry for yourself? Everything like a speck of sand. You know? <laughs> like, uh, you compare it to history, it's like, or we can make a shake. You reject feeling sorry for yourself, and then you, mm. in turn, you turn to more pride. And that's what I believe. That's what also we were trying to do. If anything, just install pride in our people. And again, uh, install, install pride and also highlight some very normal, you know, like sometimes, very too often, it's always these like exaggerated, very uh, rompous, you know, like, it's like, bro, it's everyday people is outside making contributions. And that's why I think make Oakland so beautiful. And I'm sure every ghetto in America can relate. Straight like up. just your average person and did some great things to contribute to your neighborhood. And like we tell people all the time, if we gave somebody a camera. You're going to look different for them. <laughs> They're going to have their different story. Come on. And that's the beauty of it, though, because it inspires people. You feel me? Like we talking to the kids and they're like, hey, ask your grandparents where they came from. You know what I'm saying? Like, And then you, you talk to some kid. I was talking to one kid in the class. He knew everything. My like, man, that's beautiful. I like, Probably like seventh grade, he knew everything. He was like, oh yeah, my grandparents from here. Oh, this is what happened to my daddy. This is what happened to my mama. This is what happened to my grandma. But yeah, I know all this. This, this is my family here. So I just, he's like, I just try to do what I can because I know what they did. I'm like, man, that's beautiful. That history is important. That bro. history is important because when you're able to uh, conceptualize that, you feel me? Understand your past, understand your parents, understand what they've been through, and then be able to put that to now. And you keep going back and back and back and understand it more and more. The truth. Starts to you feel me become even more clear, you know you went from 280p to 4k. Yeah. <laughs> so as we talk about, you know, people who just create art for the sake of creating art, or people who claim to be representing the masses of people, specifically New African people. You got New Africans saying, "Oh, I made this for New Africans to share light on our stories, to inspire, to motivate the people." Uh, why, if you're making declarations, why must you be amongst the people if you're making declarations like that? Because these motherfuckers who make these stories represent the ghetto but ain't been to the ghetto in years. Probably only when they record the, the movie, the video, et cetera. Then they got a 30-person security crew, <laughs> city permits, and <laughs> no, I'm going to stop talking about that. But for real, though. That's real. I mean, you can't make art for the people if you ain't around them. If you don't understand the the heartbeat of the people, how are you going to make art that represents the heartbeat of the people? Like, the community is a classroom, so you got to be amongst the community to teach the people. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you essentially bought a drone from Best Buy and launched it from your house and started recording in with a bird's thing. eye view, yeah. and then you misrepresenting the culture. you misrepresenting the people, which means you was actually leading them towards what? Neoliberalism, uh... A bad image of self, images of self-destruction versus actually being amongst the people, understanding uh, the complexity of the people, understanding the beauty of the people, understanding the struggle of the people. And when you understand all that and you're able to uh, tell that story from an authentic viewpoint, uh, from a real viewpoint, people going to relate with it. What about the folks who genuinely feel like they're doing the right thing, but uh, again, are doing what you're saying, like leading, po leading people into you know, leo neoliberalism? I mean, there's those who know, I would say. <laughs> I think there are oh, people yeah. who deliberately know and they is counter-revolutionary yeah. on purpose. Some people is just responsive to they thinking they're doing good. You know what I'm saying? But they lack a political education. Then the neoliberal system comes in and says, okay, yeah, come work with us. Oh, we're going to give you this grant. 
right? And then the neoliberal system attaches hold on to them, and now they're just doing it for the neoliberals. They're just doing it for the capitalist class, right? So I would say for anyone who is an artist and saying they want to tell the stories of the people, you got to become educated as well. It ain't just enough to, 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 to tell the story. You have to have the uh, complete historical context as well. Because if you don't have the historical context, how can you t- truly uh, tell the story? Oh, what's happened in 2023? And uh, why is the black population? Like, you just talk about, oh, if you're only just talking about uh, houselessness, like, you ain't going to get the full story. You feel me? So it's like having that historical understanding, that historical uh, uh, idea, and, and then being able to put that into reality and understand that in your framework and how you make your art becomes a lot easier. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, that's how we've tried to approach things. It's like, oh, we ain't doing nothing brand new. We're looking at the past. We're talking to elders. We're talking to OGs. And we're like, all right, how do we bring this into fruition? You know, to where, like, our media is actually, it ain't just our view, you feel me, as 30-year-olds. It's an intergenerational story guided by elders, <laughs> guided by the OGs who are telling us about Grove Street. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. guided by those stories that we don't know the same way because they lived it. You feel me? Yeah. Or, so I think that sometimes you have these academics <laughs> come in and, and and try and, you know, say they're making art in the name of the people. But they're coming in from JSTOR and they journalist, you know what I'm saying? They're coming in from these archives rather than actually being and living amongst the people to write about art, to tell the stories about art. Mm-hmm. I ain't doing it. So you got to be amongst the people, <laughs> amongst the people, with the people, struggling with the people to make good art. That's what, Emory, that's what Emory was saying. He was saying, first off, the gal- the <laughs> the community was his first gallery. So now that his shit is being in the MoMA and whatever museums, he don't care because the streets was his first gallery and he been them was the people he was doing it for. And also like actually being out there day to day doing the actual programming. Like okay, he would go from a rent strike uh, organ uh, rent strike rally to a city hall meeting to the breakfast program to work in the clinic. It's like bro. I know exactly how to talk about this shit because I'm living it. Not even, even I don't even think it's enough to just be like actually outside around the people. But nah, like you should be actually a part of the, the the solution. Like the reason why we able to talk about these stories in specific ways is because you out there doing security, right? Like you actually out watching the clinic. Driving. I've actually done <laughs> grocery program. Like I'm pulling up to taking these boxes inside the projects. I see the conditions my people are living in. So I'm seeing the real manifestation of centuries of exploitation. I know how to talk about this. Then I'm reading the book that tell me exactly how I got here, what mining company did this, did that. I'm reading what ships got us like, okay, now I got the full scope of this thing. I know exactly how this works. Now I can really speak to the social, economic, political, moral woes of my people. Mm-hmm. To the best of them that my my very limited knowledge can can uh, can uh, prov- can attest to. Right? That's where the trial and error come in too. You feel me? It's like, all right, you, you, we trying this art in the community first. Is this resonating with you? And it might not. You might have to make a shift. Mm-hmm. You feel me? Like that? that's that's the scientific process of it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, is yeah. All right, we amongst the people. Then we also like we figuring out exactly what they need, how to make things accessible to them. You feel me? Because right. we all coming in different different understandings. You know what I'm saying? So like, how do we make it all accessible too? Is important for art. Because if it ain't accessible, what is it? <laughs> the gist. Support revolutionary art. Hello. Like and subscribe. Comment on our YouTube channel. And if you ain't listening to Tales of the Town yet, get updated. Yeah, you actually, it's, it's a really <laughs> strong story. I would say that objectively. Uh, I'm one of my own harshest critics. Uh, so I, so I, I would say this. It's pretty good. <laughs> pretty good. Uh, yeah. Hella black.